<laughs> Some of you that saw my wife and daughter walk into the building this morning probably thought, man, they look really sad and upset. It's because my voice is back. <laughs> yes, they're not excited. They're not nearly as excited as I was, I'll tell you that. Another round of applause for all the Vacation Bible School volunteers. <clears throat> If you're new and this is your first week, we normally don't have tractors and barns at the front of the church. We're not weird. These are uh, decorations and decor for the Vacation Bible School. That tractor, by the way, Todd Kibler made that tractor, and I kid you not, after service, come up and check it out. That entire thing is made out of paper mache, and I'm not even joking. He is so talented. That thing's incredible. Uh, And one more announcement, also, the uh, Choices Pregnancy Center is looking for a volunteer to mow their grass this summer. If you are, if you feel compelled to volunteer some time to mow their grass, get with me after service, we'll connect you with the right, with the right people and, and get you squared away and get them some help mowing their grass. So that's, uh, that, that's a great organization here in town. We sponsor them as a church, and if we can give back any way we can, we, we try to do that. You know, as God started to lay the word uh, on us this week, he reminded me of this little bracelet that kids used to wear, and I'm going to date myself here here in just a couple seconds, but some of you are going to remember them. They were little silicone bracelets, and everybody wore them around, and it said, WWJD. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? And it was a saying that we would say as young kids and teenagers all the time when when we were presented with a situation, we'd ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? And at the time, it was just something everyone said. But as I've gotten older and I started to think about that question, how relevant is that question today? What would Jesus do? You know, it's, it's a question we should really ask ourselves in every situation we encounter in life. What would Jesus do? We should ask that question before we take any action at all, ever, before we respond respond to someone, what would Jesus do? Before we act on something, what would Jesus do? It's a question that if the entire world would ask before we took action, this would be a different place to live. What would Jesus do? But today and for the next few weeks, we're going to flip that script. We're going we're to ask a different question. We're, we're going to ask the question, what would Jesus undo? WWJU, what would Jesus undo? Imagine for a moment what it must be like to be Christ. He came to the earth, he was nailed to a cross, he took nails into his wrist and his ankles, he hung up on that cross, they shoved a a crown of thorns into his skull, they they just demolished his back with whips, They, they shred him to pieces, they spit on him, they shoved a spear into his side, he hung there in agony for all of us. Can you imagine what he thinks when he looks down on the situation of the world today and he sees all the chaos and all the hate, all the anger, all the divisiveness, all the bitterness? Can you imagine what it feels like to to be Jesus and to think, "I, I came to the cross for you and I died an agonizing death and I rose again from the dead, and I gave you this book of all these promises and all this power. I gave you the power to do all these things on this planet, and you consume yourself with hate and anger. I can't imagine the frustration that must be going through his mind, and I know without a doubt there are several things that Jesus would undo if he could. There are several things that we do in our lives that Christ would say, no, let's undo that. Well, let's try to do things a different way. What would Jesus undo? That's what we're going to focus on for the next few weeks. And I think the first thing that Christ would undo is our lack of spiritual enthusiasm. You know, Jesus wrote seven letters to seven different churches through John, and they're, and they're all compiled in the Bible, in the book of Revelation. If you've ever read or studied the book of Revelation, you'll remember he wrote one letter to, to, to Laodicea. You see, Laodicea was a city that had been destroyed by an earthquake, and they'd rebuilt their city bigger and stronger than ever. There were stadiums, there were theaters. It was the place to be. It was the biblical Las Vegas, if you will. I think back to commercials. I wonder if there was a commercial for Laodicea that said, what happens in Laodicea stays in Laodicea. If there was TVs, there would have been that commercial, I promise you. But anyway, the only thing the city of Laodicea really lacked was a consistent strength, was a consistent source of water. They, they lacked a decent water supply. 
And because of that, they had to build aqueducts to, to bring water into the city. They had to bring water either in from Colossae or from Hierapolis. Colossae was known for its really cold water. Hierapolis was known for its, its, its extremely hot springs, its extremely hot water. But here was the problem. By the time they brought that water from Colossae or Hierapolis, but by the time the water reached Laodicea, it was just lukewarm. It didn't serve any purpose anymore. It wasn't hot. It wasn't cold. It, it was just lukewarm water. Jesus wrote a letter to this, seri- to this city about their spiritual indifference. And we read it in Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 through 16. He, Jesus says, I know your deeds, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Jesus was telling the people in this city, after everything I've done for you, after all the things I've given you the power to do, after all the promises I've made to you, after all the love, grace, and mercy that I've shown you, you are apathetic. After all this stuff I've done for you, you're just going to sit there and be indifferent. You're you're just going to sit there and be lukewarm after everything I've done. No passion, no zeal, no energy. After everything I gave for you, you're going to live a lukewarm life. And when Jesus says here that he's going to spit them out of, out of his mouth, the translation in the, for the biblical word right there, when they use the word spit, is vomit. Jesus says, listen, you, your lukewarmness upsets my stomach so much, you're going to move me to vomit you out of my mouth. I'm going to throw up. I can't stand this. It makes me sick to my stomach, is what Jesus was telling him right here. Who wants another donut now, by the way? Huh? Donuts still in the back. <laughs> Their lukewarmness literally upset Jesus' stomach to the point he was going to vomit. So if Jesus wants us to undo our spiritual indifference, you see, because the Bible tells us Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So so if Jesus was moved to vomit by their lukewarmness, we know that he's also moved to vomit by our lukewarmness. We know that, that when we are spiritually indifferent, we also upset his stomach to the point where he wants to vomit us out of his mouth. So, so if we know that's true, We must understand what causes us to be lazy, indifferent, apathetic Christians. What causes us to be lukewarm in our lives? The first culprit is our spirit of being self-sufficient. The same was true for the Laodiceans. Listen to what Jesus tells them in the very next verse. Revelation chapter 3 verse 17. You say, I'm rich. I've acquired and do not need a thing. But you do not realize, Jesus says, that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. We are living the same way the Laodiceans were living right there. We're self-sufficient. We have everything we need. I have enough money. I have my dream home. I have a nice car, a huge TV, a cable package with two million channels that show, by the way, nothing but garbage. I have everything I need in life. I work hard. I don't need anyone else, or so we think. You know, here's another thing that society tricks us into believing, that society tricks us into believing that self-sufficiency is the goal. Listen, I got news for you. We are never self-sufficient. We can't do anything without God, without Christ, nothing at all. Sure, you may have some temporary victories. You may have a really large bank account. But guess what? One day, you're going to be laying in a hospital bed. If you're blessed to live long enough, you're going to be laying in a hospital bed, and you're going to realize the only thing I really have is a relationship with Christ or not. That's all that matters. When your time comes, the only thing that's important is, do I know Christ? All that money in the bank doesn't do you a bit of good. You can't buy one more day with it. That big house, you can't buy one more day of life with that house. Not with the car, not with your spouse, not with the big TV. The only possession we have that matters is relationship with Christ. That's it. In the end, it's the only thing that's going to matter. We look good to the world on the outside. 
But on the inside, we're full of dry, brittle bones when it comes to our zeal and our energy for Christ. Matthew chapter 23, verse 27 says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You're like the whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. That's how we live our lives. On the outside, we look great to everybody. Man, look at them. They're so successful. Look at that marriage. They have such a great marriage. Look at their kids. They're perfect. They have everything the world tells them they should need. I want to be like them. Man, I wish my marriage was like theirs. Oh, man, if we could only have a house like they have. Look at their car. Isn't that awesome? Can you believe all the vacations they take? Man, God has blessed them. And then inside, dry, brittle bones, death. No passion for Christ. Passion for everything the world has to offer. No passion for Christ. Leads to death every single time. The second main cause of our spiritual apathy is we are too distracted. We're too self-sufficient and we're too distracted. Listen to what Jesus tells us in Mark chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the world, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, the de desires for other things come in and choke out the word, making it unfruitful. We've all been there. Many of us are there right now. Many of us will be there this week. Many of us will be there tomorrow. Many of us will live our entire lives right there in that very same spot. We read the word. We come in and we listen to a sermon on Sunday. We feel challenged. We feel moved. We feel energized. But then life happens. We go home. The car breaks down. We lose our job. The bills pile up. And just like that, our distraction takes us right out of the word, right where we should be at that very moment. We allow the world to pull us right out of scripture. We allow Satan, who is, by the way, very much alive, we allow him to pull us right out of what God has us planted in because we are too distracted. It's not that we don't believe what the word says. We believe it. We do believe it. We know it to be true. We love Jesus. We know he loves us but we become distracted by the things of the world. And many of us just over and over and over repeat the same exact cycle. Car gets fixed, thank you God, get right back into the word. Oh, God is so good, the very next thing comes and we're distracted again. That thing gets fixed, oh, thank God, we're right back in the word, we're energized, we're passion, we, we love what's going on, then the very next distraction pops up, and we're right back off the rails. It's a cycle that we repeat all the time. It's insanity, church. You know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. By that definition, every single one of us in this room, insane. We've become insane. Our entire lives. Yeah, I love Jesus, but I don't have time to go to church. Oh, I love Jesus, but I don't have time to volunteer. Uh, I love Jesus, but I'm too busy to love my enemies. Plus, everything they've done to me is just too bad. Yeah, I love Jesus, but I'm too busy to learn what he really wants me to do. We've become lukewarm. We've become just like that water that was being brought into Laodicea. Not hot, not cold. We're just, we're just there. We've become the world. Scripture tells us not to conform. Listen, we conformed centuries ago. We have become the world. We don't even know we've become it. That journey that life has us on, just like, the, just like those aqueducts that brought all that water in. The big, long journey to Laodicea. Life is that aqueduct. Your life is that aqueduct. God is sending you through this place. This is not where we end up. We're in the aqueduct right now. God is sending you through the earth. And he wants you to make a difference on your way through. When you get to where he's bringing you, we know what Jesus says about people that are lukewarm. It makes him hurl. Don't be lukewarm. 
We've convinced ourselves that we have just enough to get by. I'm good. Listen, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. That's enough. I'm going to focus on my life. That's what many of us go through periods of life thinking. I've been there. Hey, listen, my salvation, I know enough to know I'm going to heaven. You know enough to know you're going to heaven. That's good enough. You know what that is? That's being lukewarm. That's being, listen, I used to be cold, right? When I, when I wasn't a believer, I was cold. And then I got really red hot, and I, and I got my salvation, and I was on fire. I was burning. I was, I was boiling. And then over the course of some years, life goes by, and, and day after day, the temperature goes down just a little bit. And now I'm not quite so excited as I used to be. And then before I know it, I look back and it's been 10 years since my salvation and I'm just boring and lazy. I've become lukewarm. How do we know we've become lukewarm? Number one, we're more concerned with pleasing people than pleasing God. I wonder if they like my car. What about my house? Do they like my clothes? I wonder if they think I'm cool. No, that's a real question. Do you guys think I'm cool? <laughs> Jeff, you don't have to shake your head no quite so dramatically. I get it, brother. You don't think I'm cool. <laughs> Listen to what Paul tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Sound familiar, church? Sound like you're reading a newspaper right there? People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power have nothing to do with such people. Think about that for just a second. Have nothing to do with such people. But instead of focusing on that this morning, we need to ask ourselves, are we those people? Have we become those very people that Jesus says don't have anything to do with them? <clears throat> are we those people, church? Have we become so lukewarm that we have turned into the world? You know, we preach about it all the time. Don't conform. Don't conform to the patterns of the world. And that's a very important scripture to, to remember. But even more important, church, is the question, are we the world? Have we become the very people that Jesus says, you make me sick to my stomach. I'm going to vomit you out. I can't stand lukewarm. Please be cold or hot. You know why he says that? Because at least I know where you're at. If you're cold, I'll get you some people that are hot and I'll make you hot. But if you're lukewarm and you trick people into believing that you're actually hot, but you're cold and we don't know you're cold, you die without salvation and go to hell. Jesus says, I need to know where you're at. I need to know if you're cold. You know why we... You know why Jesus, sometimes, why, why people around us don't know we're cold? Because we trick them into thinking we're hot. We're embarrassed that we don't know Christ. We're embarrassed by the sin that trips us up. We're embarrassed by our past addictions. We're embarrassed by all the times we've gotten in trouble by the law. We're embarrassed by our divorces. We're embarrassed by this or that. Listen, we've all been there. We've all been cold. We've all been in trouble, except me. Gee, Darren, thanks a lot. <clears throat> Darren always has my back. Thanks, Darren. <laughs> Listen to what 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 says. Do not love the world. Listen, or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. Jesus doesn't just say, hey, listen, don't love the world. He says, don't love anything in it. Nothing. Not one thing. Do not be consumed with life on this earth is what he's telling us. And listen, guys, yeah, some of you all are thinking, no, he just told me not to love my spouse. No, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> Jesus is saying, do not be consumed with this place. This is not where you're going. 
This is not your final destination. You're passing through. Don't fall in love with anything here because you're not staying here long. Life is but a vapor. You're going to be here and then gone. Do not get tied down to this place. I need you somewhere else. Lukewarm believers concern themselves all too much with life on this earth. How much money can I make? How many cars can I buy? I need this. I need that. We've become obsessed with our short time on this planet. Instead of focusing on the task that Christ sent us here to accomplish. You know, I was watching uh, Francis Chan one time, and he gave this, this uh, illustration that we'll always remember. He had this big, long rope, and if we had it here at the sanctuary, it'd stretch all the way around this room, and it was just a big rope, and it had a little sliver of duct tape at the end of it. And he said, you know, the rope is like eternity. The rope is your soul. It goes, it goes around the room forever. And that little sliver of, of, of electrical tape, that is your life on this earth. And we live our entire life just focused on that one little sliver of tape. And we got the whole rope. Your soul lives forever. Why are we so focused on this little sliver right here on this planet and accumulating as much as we can just right here when we have the whole rope? What we should be focused on on this little sliver is making sure everyone else realizes your rope also goes forever. When you die here, do you know where you're going next? That's the most important task you have right here on this little sliver is, is knowing what's after the little sliver. Because listen, if you don't have Christ, that's it for you. If you do, your rope just keeps going and going and going. And listen, even if you don't have Christ, your rope keeps going and going and going. But you're, you're not where you need to be. You're not with Christ for all of your rope. You're in hell. You're separated from him. Here's what we do. This is how insane we've become in the United States. We don't even just focus on the whole sliver of tape. We focus on the little piece in the sliver called retirement. We live this whole sliver right here for one little inkling of a, oh, I can take it easy for these six years. We live our entire life doing all this stuff so we can just maybe, if we're lucky, have five or six years right here at the end. Why do we do that? Why are we so obsessed with five years when we have eternity, church? By the way, if you're my generation, there is no retirement, so good luck with that. <laughs> Mark's generation's taking it all. <laughs> <clears throat> if you're my generation, stay after church. Mark and Patty will cut you a check. <laughs> we have become so obsessed with this little sliver of time. God looks down and says, no, that's, you're lukewarm. Nope, you're lukewarm. And we, we live life thinking, man, I'm, I, I'm on fire. I got another raise at work. I got a promotion. Got the wife a new van. We got a new car. We are doing so great. God is blessing us so much. And God says, no, you're lukewarm. That makes me sick to my stomach right there. Lukewarm is what you are. We must be focused on what he sent us here to do. The third sign we've become lukewarm. So we know now we're too... We, we think we're self-sufficient. We're too distracted. What's the third sign we've become lukewarm? We rationalize our sin. Have you noticed in our culture we just change the names of sin to make them sound better? It's not adultery. It's just an affair. It's not drunkenness. Just a few beers after work every single night of the week. It's not pride. I'm just really confident. No, nah, I'm, not, I'm not gossiping about her. I'm just really concerned about her. We've become so obsessed with ourselves, we've renamed our sin to make us feel better. That's, what it's that's exactly what it's like to be lukewarm, church. We convince ourselves that, well, listen, my sins aren't as bad as hers. He's an alcoholic. I'm just a weekend drinker. She's an adulterer. I'm just flirting with my coworker. We've become lovers of ourselves. Remember that scripture? We have become lovers of ourselves. And so we change the name of our sin because we don't want to upset ourselves because we love ourselves so much, we, we can't offend ourselves. Listen, I'm not having an affair. I'm not, I'm not committing adultery. It's just, it's just a little affair. I'm not that big of an alcoholic. Lukewarm tells us our sins aren't bad. Scripture tells us to turn from the very sins. Acts chapter 3 verse 19 says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. 
The times of refreshing may come from the Lord. The fourth sign we've become lukewarm. We love Christ. This is crazy. It's how God works. Mark had no idea what I was preaching on. He's already talked to you about it this morning. We love Christ, but we rarely or ever, most of us never share our faith with anyone else. The question that God has really put on my mind the last few months, actually, is if you're not spreading the gospel, do you even really believe it? If you're not telling people about what I did, do you really understand what I did? Listen to what Mark chapter 16, verse 15 says. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. The corn's even falling down here this morning. <laughs> it's harvest time, Angie. <laughs> go into all the world and preach the gospel. If you're lukewarm, when you read that, you think, listen, I don't want to go here. I, I, I'm not going to overstep my boundaries here. I don't really know if they want to hear what I have to say. I don't know if this is appropriate. The world will tell us it's inappropriate here or there. I don't know if I, don't know if I can go here. I don't want to overstep my boundaries. That's lukewarm. Red Hot says there's no boundaries when it comes to Christ. Scripture, there is no line that you can't cross to tell people about Jesus Christ. Listen, you may have people of authority say you can't do that. It's not in the Bible. You might have some man-made rules that I can't do that here, but Scripture tells me go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Scripture tells us to spread the word, the word to the entire world. Lukewarm tells us to be lazy and apathetic. Lukewarm tells you not to offend people. How offended do you think people are going to be if you go to heaven and someone else goes to hell and they realize, wait a second, Darren knew how I could not end up here and he never told me how I could not end up here. Can you imagine how offended they're going to be when they realize they're in hell because you didn't have the guts to tell them about Christ? Maybe we should be worried about offending people for eternity, not for 15 or 20 minutes. And listen, if they don't want to hear what you have to say, Scripture doesn't say, hey, listen, if they don't listen the first time, make sure you sit them down and make them believe it. Scripture just tells you, hey, just spread the gospel. Just plant the seeds. You, their reaction is not your responsibility. Your responsibility is right here. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. You can't control how they react, but you can control whether you're obeying or not. You can control whether you're lukewarm or hot. Scripture tells us to spread the word. The fifth sign we've become lukewarm, and we've all been here too. We only tur turn to him when we need him. He's like, we think he's like a genie in the bottle. We rub it, and he pops out, and he grants us two wishes, and then he goes back. That's how we treat Christ. We carry him around in this little genie bottle. Car breaks down, we rub the bottle. Lose the job, we rub the bottle. Marriage problems, we rub the bottle, bottle, whatever it is, the genie bottle. You guys are getting me all worked up. <laughs> Life gets tough, rub the bottle some more. That genie will pop out. Jesus is in there, just keep rubbing it. Jesus is a tool. We use him like a tool just when we need him. We act like he's a hammer in the tool bag. Nail pops out of the fence, we get him out and we hammer that nail right back in there. Fence is good for three or four, if I do it, a couple hours. <laughs> if a real carpenter does it, a few months. Nail pops back out, you get Jesus out, and you hammer that nail right back in the fence again, you're good to go. Then we put them right back in the tool bag. If you're also like me, you lose the tool bag a lot, mainly because you don't want to use the tools to begin with. That's how we treat Christ. He's just a tool. We use him just like we'd use money. We use them like we use our jobs. If money can get us out of the problem, we go to the money before we go to Christ. Money's always the first tool we use in any situation in life, really. God says, come to me first. Come to me first. I'm the one that gave you the money. I know you have the money. Come to me first. Don't just put me in the tool bag. Keep me out. We're called to lean on Jesus at all times. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 4 says, trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord himself is the rock eternal. He's there forever. 
Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. We're too self-sufficient, church. We're too distracted. We are too lukewarm. The final sign we've become lukewarm believers. And listen, this is going to step on a lot of toes this morning. I've already stepped on mine multiple times right in this sermon. The final sign that we've become lukewarm believers is when we realize we're not all that different from the world. We're not different at all. We're entertained by the same things. We watch the same movies. We spend our money on the same things. We raise our kids by the same exact standards that the world sets. We realize we're lukewarm because we fit in. We fit into the world. We were never designed to fit into the world, church. We were designed to be transformed and to help transform everyone around us. The biggest sign that the, that the, that the believers of the world fit into the world now, just turn on the news channel. All this hate, bitterness, divisiveness, anger all the time. We're addicted to being angry because we fit in. We're just like the rest of the world. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. When we do that, church, the world will hate you. They will despise you. Once again, Mark's already touched on this, which is crazy. No clue what I was preaching on, and he's already got three of the scriptures out of the way for me. So the sermon's over, guys. We'll see you next week. (laughs) The world will hate you when you don't conform. And we're scared of that. Why? Go back a few verses because we love ourselves. We don't want anyone to hate us. I love myself too much to be put in this position. I can't put myself through this. I'm too angry. I'm too embarrassed. I'm too nervous. I don't want to make myself go through that because you love yourself too much. God says, I need to use you. I need you. Don't worry about yourself, God says. Worry about what I have planned for you and everyone around you. You know, God used Christ to come to the cross. There was a point in time where Jesus Christ himself said, God, listen, if there's any other way we can do this, can we please do it some other way? But then at the very end of that, Jesus says, but listen, God, not my will, but yours. It's okay to be nervous about what God has you to do. Jesus Christ himself was nervous. Jesus Christ himself had some anxiety in that moment. It's okay to feel that way. But in the end, make sure you tell him, hey, listen, not my will, yours. If this is really what you need me to do, I'll go do it. Listen, I'm going to hate every second of it, God, but I'm going. I'm going to do it. I'm going to be nervous the whole way up to their door, but I'm going to go and do it. I don't know what I'm going to say, God. I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I will go and do it if you want me to. And that's another thing we do. Remember, Moses told God over and over, God, I don't speak well. I can't, there's no way I can do this. I'm not a good speaker. Eventually, Cliff's Notes version, God gets to the point, he says, would you just shut up and go do it? I'm going to tell you what to say. Just zip your lips and go. It's not you, Moses, that's going to do this. It's me through you. I know you can't do it. I'm I'm well aware, Moses, that you can't split the Red Sea, but I can. All I need is your obedience and the miracle. I will work through your life. You won't work the miracle. God says, I'll do it through you. Just go and be obedient. Church, we will never experience what God has for us if we're lukewarm our whole lives. We'll never overcome our sin. You will never overcome your addiction if you're lukewarm. If you just rename the sin, you're not facing it. You'll never overcome it. God is calling us today to step out of being lukewarm and to start leading a life that makes a difference. So how do we do that? How do we do that? If we're lukewarm, how do we go from lukewarm to hot or cold? Listen, just pick a side so we know where you're at. How do we do that? Read the Bible. Number one step. Read the Bible. Listen, if you don't go through all these steps, just get to the first one. Read the Bible. It's that simple. When you start reading scripture, you will understand, my gosh, this is, this is crazy stuff in here. 
God says I can do that? This is nuts. <clears throat> I will tell you what, the very first time I read the Bible from front to back, something happened. You can feel it happen. When, when you start to understand what's in those pages, and you start to look at life just a little bit different than you did before, it's because you understand God wrote this book he created us. He wrote these instructions to us in this book. And if we just do what the book says, then God does what he says he'll do. And when God says that, when God does what he says he'll do, that means victory's yours. You win. But you have to understand the story first. You have to understand your role in that first. You don't just rub the, it's not like the bottle. You can't just rub the Bible and everything happen. You have to read, you have to put those words inside of you. And the most important reason you do that, besides for yourself, is so that at the opportune times, you can plant those same words into someone else's life. You can tell people, hey, listen, I know you're going, you know what the Bible says about that? You know what scripture says about that situation right there? And you don't have to be a biblical scholar. Trust me when I tell you, you do not have to be a biblical scholar to read the Bible and understand it. Some of you that haven't read it, I know you're, what you're thinking. That big, giant King James version that you got to carry in with both hands. You flip the big cover over. Phew, all these pages, all these art thals. Listen, there's modern translations that you can actually read and understand. Read it. Don't make excuses for why you're not. Just read the Bible. If you come in here on Sunday mornings and this is the only scriptures you're getting, you're cheating yourself. That's who you're cheating you're cheating yourself, and you're cheating everyone that God has put around you. That's who you're cheating. Read the Bible. Because when I read the Bible, God might be telling me one thing through the story. When you read it, he might be telling you something completely different that applies to your situation, not mine. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says this, tells us the word of God is alive and active. You know why it says that? Because when you read it, he takes those very words and he knows what you're going through and he speaks to you into your situation through those words. I could read the same words and he could tell me a completely different message because what I'm going through, the Bible's yours to read, not just mine. Next week, we're going to read the Bible from front to back. It's going to be about a 72-hour service. <clears throat> <laughs> Lois is actually going to read the whole Old Testament herself. <laughs> Darren, don't laugh. You got the New Testament, brother. <laughs> read the Bible. There's too many of us that are lukewarm. We don't even take the Bible off the shelf. Maybe you're lukewarm. You don't even own a Bible. Listen, if that's the case, remember God doesn't like lukewarm. It's okay that you don't own a Bible, but admit, I don't have a Bible. Listen, in this situation, I'm cold. I want to be hot. Find me. We'll get you a Bible. You don't have to be without one. You don't even have to buy one. We'll give it to you. How else do we overcome it? We pray. Read the Bible and pray. The two most important things you could ever do in your life. When's the last time you prayed? It's an indication on whether you're cold or hot. When's the last time you prayed by yourself? When's the last time you prayed with your spouse or your family at the dinner table? When's the last time you prayed with your kids when you tucked them into bed? Take a mental inventory of your prayer life. Where is it at, church? Are you hot or cold? Don't go through life pretending you're hot if you're cold. That is what it means to be lukewarm. And God says, listen, that turns my stomach. Don't be like that. Fellowship with other believers. Surround yourself with other people that believe in, in Christ. But surround yourself. You know, the Bible tells us, hey, if you're by yourself and you fall down, you're in a lot of trouble. The Bible tells you that. But it, but it also says, listen, if you surround yourself with other believers and you fall down, you're in much better shape because one of those people reached reach down and help pull you up. How many people do you have in your circle that believe in Christ? Listen, I know Sunday mornings are important, but listen, you're not here Monday through Saturday. What if you fall down on Tuesday? If you fall down on Sunday, we're here. The altars are here. We'll pray with you. We'll pick you up. But when you go out these doors on Tuesday and you fall down, are you just laying there till Sunday again? Because God's got stuff for you to do Tuesday and Wednesday. Don't stay there. 
Get up. Surround yourself with people that'll say, man, you fell again, hop up, get up. Surround yourself with people that'll make you get up. But surround yourself with people that won't just feel sorry for you when you lay down there and say, oh, listen, you, you've had it rough. Just stay down there for a few more days. Surround yourselves with people that'll say, get up. Would you get up, you wuss? Surround yourself with those people that'll tell you the hard truth. Quit being such a wimp and stand up. We got work to do. You don't have time to lay there. We surround ourselves with people that tell us what we want to hear. We surround ourselves with people that allow us to just lay there. Don't do that. And listen, if you've got people around you, don't be that person either. You tell your friend, you get up. We have stuff to do. Give them a hug, but make them stand up. Make sure you hug them at the end. We're not called to be mean. (laughs) The world is full of people who believe in God, live life, and die. Many of us in this room is exactly how we're living our life right now. Believe in God, live life. Your salvation is guaranteed, sure, you're going to heaven. That's great. We live life, we believe in God, we die. We go to heaven. All these people around us, no clue if they're saved or not. No clue. People in our own family, we have no clue if they even know Christ. Not one, not one clue. Why? Because we're too scared to ask them. Why? Because we have become the world. We don't want to offend them. You really want to make your family go crazy this Thanksgiving? Ask them all. You believe in Jesus? If not, we're going to read the Bible. (laughs) Might be your last Thanksgiving, so enjoy the turkey. But ask them. (laughs) Ask them. You don't want a family member to die and think, I have no clue. I don't have a single clue if I'm going to see him again or not. What a shame. Shame on us for that. That's our job. We know what the word tells us. We know how people make it to heaven. And when we take all that information, we keep it for ourselves. We're being selfish. We're keeping the gospel all to myself. Listen, there's plenty of it to go around. You can pass it out. Give it away. You know, we had vacation Bible school last week. I'm going to close with this. There were families that came in here that don't go to church. I'm going to tell a short little story. I had to be uh, Zacchaeus up here on stage. Uh, Leslie was my arms. It was actually quite ridiculous looking. (laughs) Yeah, thanks for the encouragement, Jeff. (laughs) And I was up here, and part of my script was I had to say, as Zacchaeus, I had to say, I don't blame people for not liking me because I don't even like myself. And over here in the corner of the room, There was a nine-year-old, eight, nine-year-old boy, just sat on, unassuming. He was paying attention the whole weekend. And I heard him say, same. Same, he said. And I, I had to take a moment and process what I just heard. But out here in the crowd at Vacation Bible School, a nine-year-old boy sits out in the crowd. The world looks at him, everything's fine. He's got a good family. And he does. He has a really, really good family. He's well taken care of. He's well fed. He's well spoken. He's a smart young man. One word in the middle of a vacation Bible study skit. Same. When Zacchaeus said, I don't even like myself. That is why it's important we tell people about Christ. That boy needed to know, listen, Christ loves you, man. Why don't you like yourself, dude? You're an awesome kid. You're a cool kid, man. We love you. That's why we can't be too embarrassed to tell people about Christ. If nobody tells this young man about Christ, then we got a 20-year-old that hates himself. Then we got a 25-year-old that's contemplating suicide. Then we have a 30-year-old that's depressed. And then we have a 35-year-old that's addicted to alcohol and drugs. We have to tell people about Christ. That's why. That's why I can't be selfish It has nothing to do with me. It has to do with that little boy, the little girl. And you know why it's important they know that? Because when they're 40, yes, I'm 40, there's going to be a nine-year-old boy out in his vacation Bible study that says the same thing. 
And that boy can say, hey, I've been there. I used to be you. Let me tell you what happened to me at Family Worship Center. Let me tell you about these people that had the guts to tell me about Christ when I didn't know them. This life is not about us. This life is not, my life is not about me. Your life is not about you. It's about the people God puts you in touch with. Our little time, our little sliver of this earth has nothing to do with us. It has to do with 200 years from now. 300 years from now. Don't believe me? Think about Noah for just a moment when he built that ark. Sure, yeah, the, the ark allowed him and his family to survive the flood. But because of him, we are here thousands of years later. The ark was about you and I. The ark was about everyone that came after Noah. And that's what your life is about. It's about everyone that comes after you. The people before you were here for you. And you are here for the people after you. We have to focus on what God wants us to do. I read a quote one time in a book said, your, your kids are a message you will send into a time you will not see. Think about how powerful that statement is for a moment. Our kids are children. If you don't have kids, you got young kids in your family somewhere. Those kids are a message you are sending into a time that you won't see. What message are you giving them? Are you giving them a lukewarm message? Are you giving the little nine-year-old boy that sits out in the crowd of vacation Bible study the lukewarm message that said, hey, yeah, I know, man, I get it. Come on, it, life will get better. That's lukewarm. God says, that makes me vomit. I need you to tell that young boy exactly what I've done for him. When we decide not to be lukewarm anymore, that's when we get bold. That's when we turn to God at all times, not just when the flat tire on the car pops up. It's when we start walking the walk that God's called us to walk. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they will eat with me. Lukewarm tells us to stay on that couch. He'll keep knocking. You don't have to answer right now. You do not have to answer that door right now. We act like Jesus is some, is some, what are those people that come around to your door, Mark? No, the salespeople. <clears throat> Whatever. <clears throat> we act like it's the guy selling the $10,000 vacuum cleaner at the door. Now, if he comes, don't answer. You don't need a $10,000 vacuum cleaner. We just let him knock and knock and knock. Months, years go by, he's standing there still knocking. We turn the TV up louder so we can't hear him. We turn the volume of the world up so we don't hear him knocking. Yeah, you hear God in the back of your mind, but you're addicted to something. You, you turn the volume of your addiction up so you can't hear him knocking. I don't want to hear him. I'm going to pretend like he's not there. He's there. Listen, there's no excuse to not see him now. They have ring doorbells. You can see him out there. You see him standing at that front porch knocking. Jesus says, I don't care who you are. I'm at your door knocking. I don't care if you're a nine-year-old boy that's never heard of me. I'm at your door knocking. I don't care if you're 85 years old in this room right now and have never accepted Christ. Jesus Christ is still standing at that door knocking, and you have time to answer it still. Answer the door. When you do that, he comes in. Scripture says, I come in and I eat with you. You know what he says? I sit down at your table. I sit at the very table in your house, even, even though you've lived 80 years of denying me, I'm going to come in and share a meal with you. And then you're going to eat with me. We're going to talk. We're going to have a relationship. And then once you have a relationship with me, your rope goes all the way around the room with me. You don't have to worry about that little sliver anymore because you realize I got eternity doesn't matter what you have done. Listen, I don't care what you did last night. I don't care what you did last month. I don't care what you did last year. I don't care how many times you've been arrested. I don't care how many DUIs you've gotten. I don't care. I don't care about any of that. 
Christ is at your door. It's not too late. The world tells you it's too late. You're too far gone. You're too addicted. Listen, you're just going to be a loser the rest of your life. You just stay down there. Remember, who do you have yourself surrounded with? You got yourself surrounded with people to tell you, yep, that's exactly where you belong. You stay right down there. We're embarrassed by you. Don't, don't you stand up and be seen with me, brother. Listen, I'll come over here in the dark time and help you. But when the sun comes up and people see me, I got to get away from you. I can't let people know I'm over at your house. Are you one of those people? Have we become the world without even knowing it, church? Have we lived life for so long in that aqueduct that we, although we were once cold and then red hot, we, we end up at the city, we end up at the place God has sent us, and we show up and, and we're lukewarm? The world doesn't need any more lukewarm believers, church. The world's full of them. Absolutely full of them. Today we make the commitment, we're not going to be lukewarm anymore. What would Jesus undo? Your lukewarmness. My lukewarmness. That's one thing he would undo. So let's help him undo it. We have the power to change that in our own lives. Today we stand up and we stand firm. Boldly open that door. What would Jesus do? We know what he would do. The question is, and I'm going to make silicone bracelets for you next week. It's going to say W-A-G-T-D-D-T. Rolls right off the tongue. W-A-Y-G-T-D-T. Not even going to tell you what it means. <laughs> what are you going to do today? What are you going to do right now? Don't think about next week. Listen, you don't even know if you'll be here next week. Don't make big, long. The Bible tells us, listen, you make all these plans. You make all these plans. Worry about right now. The only moment we know we're going to be alive on this planet, right this very instant. Listen, I might not make it out these doors today. You might not either. We don't know. What are we going to do this very moment? It's the only moment that really matters. It's the only moment you're guaranteed is right now. Take advantage of that. Take advantage of this moment right here. Don't be lukewarm anymore. Lukewarm tells you you got the rest of your life. Being on fire says, listen, might be in two hours. I, I got work to do. I got to do these things that the Bible tells me to do. I don't know if I'll be here tomorrow. Lukewarm says you got plenty of time. Plenty of time. Scripture says no one knows the hour. Nobody knows the hour. Christ may come back this afternoon. Let's hope he does. My gosh, let's hope he does. Take advantage of right now. Don't be the person that believes in God, lives life, and then dies. Don't be that person. Be the person that believes in God. Tells other people what God has done for them. Be the person that believes in God. Leads other people to God, to Christ. Be the person that believes in God and helps people in need. Be the person that believes in God and lives scripture. Be the person that believes in God and never dies. And are surrounded in heaven by a bunch of people you told about Christ that will also never die because you had the guts to not be lukewarm. Church, we are not lukewarm. This church, Family Worship Center, listen, some of you are thinking, my gosh, man. Wow. You really don't like us. <laughs> Just a couple of you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> The message is for you to tell other people. We, we have a congregation that's very much not lukewarm. We have a congregation here that's very much on fire. The goal is to stay there. Surround yourself with the people that it will keep your embers burning hot. We should come into these doors on Sunday morning. You should come in here spiritually exhausted because you've poured yourself out all through the week. 
And you come in here, mainly for the donut and the sermon and the music, but you come in here to really refresh yourself and to get spiritual energy again so you can go out next week and do the same thing over and over again. Pay attention to the people that say same to the world. Pay attention to the young ones that hear the world's message and say same. Those are the people that need you to be red hot, church. We start it this morning, guys. Let's start this morning casting off the spirit of lukewarmness, church, and getting ourselves back on fire for what God has planned for us and for what God's going to do through us. Can you imagine for a moment Moses as he stood at the Red Sea and he held out his staff and he saw the Red Sea literally split in two? Can you imagine if he turned around and said, yeah, come on, I know. He had to be like, what in the world? You have tons of Red Sea moments in your life that have already happened to you. And oftentimes we just cross through it. Yeah, I know. It's just a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. God used you to part the Red Sea so that you could walk through it, but he didn't just part the Red Sea for Moses. Yeah, Moses made it through, but Moses' life was about all the people behind him. Moses parted the Red Sea so the people behind him could walk through on the dry ground. That's what he's using you for. Stand there boldly. Listen, and it's okay to be nervous, but stand there right at the edge of the problem, right at the edge of the Red Sea, and it's okay to say, no clue how he's going to do it but I know he's going to do it. And then when he does it, you look at everybody behind you and say, you see the miracle? Now, come on, let's go. Let's go. Let's get through this. That's what it's like to be red hot, church. Not knowing how, but knowing he will. And it's a guaranteed promise right from Scripture, and it's for you this morning, church. God, we thank you for this word. God, we thank you for everything you're doing at Family Worship Center, God, around the globe. We thank you for the fact, Lord, that we don't have to live our lives being lukewarm. God, we thank you for the fact that we can do everything the Bible tells us we can do. We thank you for all the promises in the Bible. God, we thank you for the, the ability to make sure people know. We, we thank you for the ability to tell people about your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, that we live in a country where it's legal for us to do so. But God, we ask you to give us the courage to, to even spread it where it's not okay. We ask you to, to give us the courage to spread it where it's, where it's not allowed. You tell us to spread the gospel to all creation and to all the world, God. We ask you to just give us a passion and an energy, God. We ask you to just make us red hot this morning so that we can tell everyone around us about Christ and the salvation that can be theirs as well. We thank you for Jesus Christ on the cross. We thank you for the blood he shed for us, God. Most of all, Lord, we thank you for the empty tomb on that third day that allows us to live forever with you in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.